Welcome to Coffee Talk with Design Research Collective. I'm your host, Sarah Freilich. Our guest today is the wonderful and very wise Ashley Moser Francis. Ashley is a senior human centered design strategist at one of the biggest global medical device companies based here in Minnesota, Medtronic. She's worked there for the last two years. She is an anthropologist with a master's from Brandeis. She is an avid bird watcher, an empathetic human with a lot of experience relating healthcare to human centered design. I look forward to the conversation ahead where you'll learn about her career journey, her fondness for bird watching, and really the responsibility she feels in doing research in the healthcare space when it comes to patient advocacy and doing the right thing for our patients. Amazing. So Ashley, I'm so excited that you came here today um, and really excited to talk about what you and I both have in common yes. and the work that we do. Um, I know that you've spent the later part of your career now at Medtronic in the Innovation Lab. Yeah doing a lot of human-centered design and design research, as well as working at other companies. And just like myself, you have a master's in anthropology from Brandeis yes. with um, women's studies. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you don't mind giving an introduction to me and anyone else that's listening about you, yeah. And we do this funny introduction at DRC called Jekyll and Hyde, <laughs> which is tell us about your day job, mm. but then tell us a little bit about what happens when you're not working. Yeah. Who's your, your Hyde or your Jekyll, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> your day job, your day persona, and your night persona. Yeah. I can start. So <laughs> during the day, um, I am CEO at Design Research Collective. And at night, as some people have already heard, I'm a mom with a messy minivan running kids back and forth to hockey, basketball, guitar, piano. So Love it. that's a little bit about me. <laughs> what about you, Ashley? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so yeah, you kind of started the introduction. So I work uh, at the Innovation Lab uh, for Medtronic. Uh, I think my working title is Senior Human Centered Design Strategist. Uh, but I predominantly do design research there, uh, and we function as an internal consultancy. So we partner with teams across the company uh, and really work to keep the human at the center of whatever experience or product service that we uh, are working to develop uh, or improve. So it's a super fun and interesting. There's always something new. I love that we get to partner with teams all across the company. Um, and yeah, I honestly feel so lucky uh, mm -hmm. to have my day job, not at work. Um, I am a dog mom. We talked about it a little bit. Uh, I have a rescue named Donovan, my husband and I do. So I think like a lot of times uh, I'm snuggling with Donovan uh, on the couch, watching a family drama. I like to read. Um, I like nature as well. So we like to get out and go hiking at times. Um, Bird watching has kind of snuck up on me. Uh, my partner is a know. big bird watcher. What? Yes, uh, there's a certain age where it just the, <laughs> yes. a flip, yeah. a switch flips. Yeah, yeah. And you're into birds. Yes, yeah. Did it, it happen to you? It recently? did. I. It's a little. You know, my husband grew up bird watching, uh -huh. um, and so I think uh, I had exposure earlier in my 20s to it. But I will say, like the last couple years, I've been like, what's that? I just bought my first pair of binoculars. <laughs> So exciting, um, but yeah, he'll probably be really excited. <laughs> I'm talking about bird watching, but oh my goodness, do you have a journal? Okay, we'll, we'll just a couple <laughs> follow ups and we'll get back yeah. to business. Do you have a journal of birds you've seen? I don't, so I'm like very early in, okay. but we were up on the North Shore a couple weekends ago. We love northern Minnesota and we were hiking, and I saw an owl for the first time. And it was flying away, but it was like the most spectacular thing. Um, so I think I need to start one. Yeah, that's I'm just amazing. starting to get my gear. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I wonder if there's any analogies with bird watching and being an anthropologist. Mm. I feel like there are. You know, I saw so, um, Apple TV has a 
new series for Harriet the Spy, mm -hmm. which I didn't read as a child, but I will occasionally watch the cartoon if I just need something light. And, you know, she's training to be a spy, and she's been told you have to, like, know everything to be a spy. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's an episode on bird watching, So I think to that yes. <laughs> example, I think so, you know? You're sort of observing, watching, yeah. you know, sometimes trying to go into the background a little bit. I like that metaphor. We're kind of like spies. Yeah. And good spies. Good spies. And like yeah. good spies, spies that um, with consent. <laughs> yes. Yes. And spying people with their yes. consent. Yes. Yes. Important. We yeah. sign all their, the good documents and we say, can we watch you work? Can we watch you mm -hmm. um, get on this app? Can we watch you, you know, go, go to your healthcare provider? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, too, right, the difference. They know we're present, so it has yeah. an impact, of course. Um, whereas, like, if you're truly spying, yes. but not so ethical. Yes, exactly. Like that, so. Exactly, yeah. Um, especially in healthcare, ethics come up a lot. And mm -hmm. just, like, getting consent and making sure the power dynamic with who you're talking to. Yeah, um, super important. Super important. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, one of the um, questions we like to ask people, or we have on our list, is... What do you tell a four-year-old, let's say, or a grandmother, or like, you know, your neighbor that asks what you do? Mm -hmm. What are the layers of what you tell Ooh. people what it's you do? It's tough. It's tough. I was thinking about this last night as I was kind of, I was reading through the questions again. Um, and I don't, I still don't know. I don't have a direct answer. Um, but I usually, I, I sort of kind of feel it out to see like what, level of exposure yeah. maybe somebody has to kind of what we do. Um, but I think in, in really simple terms, I'm trying to remember what I came up with for like the four year old. I think I said, I help people who make things um, do like a better job, I guess. Um, I, that's not exactly the right way, I but I help it. people who make things. Um, um, I think the other way is like keeping the human at the center. You know, I said that at the beginning, I work to keep the human at the center of whatever experience we're creating or product we're creating. Um, you know, if, it, if, if sometimes I'll say qualitative research, yeah. um, sometimes I'll say human centered design, but I tend to try to like stay away from those because I think unless it's other industry folks, you know, qualitative versus quantitative data. Like, I don't know, I learned that in school. Um, yeah. So depending on the coursework that you took, those sort of things. Um, yeah, so I think something around just trying to make things better for people and understanding their experiences, their needs, and really centering those in the process. Because I think there's a lot of examples where that has not happened historically in design or certain people's experiences and perspectives, right, have historically yeah. been centered. So. How do we um, work to kind of undo some of that and, and do better for all, you know, we all have opportunity to do better. I love that. What do you think is, what would you name the, the transition? I have an idea and I can share it. I'm curious if you have any, and you just articulated a bit, but like we're, we were in this era mm -hmm. and human centered design and the innovation lab and the work that I do is trying to move people to this mindset. Mm -hmm. Do you have any words that you use to name kind of aside from putting the human in the center? Yeah. yeah. I think empathy is a big one, yeah. right? Um, you know, and I think it's becoming more mainstream for people to talk about empathy. You know, for a long time it was like compassion or sympathy people would talk about, right? But empathy yeah. I think is really different. Um, but yeah, I think just this idea of you know, as much as you can, putting yourself in someone else's shoes or understanding someone else's worldview. I think for me, the tie with anthropology is just like a really natural extension, right? Um, part of what really drew me to anthropology when I first learned about it was just this idea of like, whoa, I, you know, I was born in a certain place with certain people and uh, certain opportunities and that really shapes how I see and experience the world and somebody is entirely different, right? Um, for whatever, you know, again, just depending on where you're born or a lot of things that are, can be out of your control. Um, so I think that just really resonated with me and, and kind of understanding that that's a really valid thing, right? Like we can have these two really different worldviews mm -hmm. um, and it's so valid and it's true, right? Like it's true. <laughs> um, so, 
Yeah, I think just kind of getting into, I don't know if I'm answering your question. You totally but. <laughs> are. I, I <laughs> That's love where you're going. That's sort of what brought me, yeah, brings me to, to this work. I love where you're going. It makes me curious. Um, we've never talked about what you studied in, in yeah. anthropology when you were in the in academic phase of your life. Yeah. If you're up for sharing. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I... I'll say I came to anthropology a little bit late in my undergrad career. Uh, so I was um, originally pre-med. Wow, um, really? Yeah, and then wasn't really enjoying that. Uh, found women's studies, which sort of like shattered, you know, just was a very like earth shattering experience. Yeah. Like I had words for things that I didn't know yeah. existed. Um, and then I think kind of through that path, I was introduced to anthropology and so actually just had a minor in anthropology in undergrad. Um, and then, yeah, decided to get a master's degree. Um, and I, my thesis was really focused on, um, feminists in, uh, conservative places. So I actually did wow. a little bit of like an auto ethnography, but also not, um, but I actually went back home and I interviewed feminists and progressives who were living on the prairie in North Dakota, um, kind of understanding, you know, their perspectives and experiences. I left and, you know, for a long time, was like, I never want to go back. It's, it's hard to be home for a mm -hmm. lot of different reasons. And so I was really interested in like the people who stayed yeah. um, and who intentionally chose to stay and kind of do that work there. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's what I focused on. That's incredible. Yeah. It's so, so it's very similar to what I studied too. Really? Well, it, it was, <laughs> I, I originally studied, um, Jewish feminist rituals. Okay. Because the program that Ashley and I did was anthropology with a focus in women and gender studies. Yeah. Um, joint, both did that. a joint program. Yeah. So, yeah. Wait, so that was mm -hmm. normal. And then I actually, um, moved and, and studied this community of black women mm -hmm. um, business owners that were mm -hmm. that owned hair salons in a neighborhood of Boston called West Medford. Um, and there was just this huge, I, I don't want to say huge, but really vibrant community of black women and hair salons mm -hmm. and their life and how their worlds um, revolved around the community. And the barbershop became kind of this epicenter. Yeah. Um, so that very cool. Yeah. So so then we jump to to this world. Yeah. Can you tell us more about like the steps that that you've taken from your master's work and then yeah. into into your role today, if you will? Yeah, I think you know it was. Uh, I don't know. It wasn't. I don't want to say it wasn't intentional, but I think it's one of those things looking back, it all makes sense, yeah. the path to get here. Uh, but post-grad school, I actually was working um, for the Minnesota Women's Press, shout out, feminist yeah. local publication um, based here out of the Twin Cities. Uh, and I, I worked with them for many, many years before grad school and just coming out of grad school, there, there was a... An equal need and so I, I landed there uh, and was doing you know business development I was doing ad sales uh, but really kind of in charge of, of that component of the work there and uh, kind of as an extension I started doing just some like human-centered consulting almost mm -hmm. as, as some of the work that we were doing uh, and then the pandemic hit uh, and I was uh, contract. I wasn't working there full time. Uh, I was doing some restaurant work, kind mm -hmm. of applying for other jobs. You know, I knew I wanted to do applied anthropology, but I didn't know exactly what that looked like. So I was meeting with other folks um, who were kind of in this, in this realm. Um, I met with some um, like ad agencies and yeah. explored that route. I think earlier you were saying, you know, food, like, did you ever work in like the food with food or um, non-medical, uh, you know, applied anthropology. And I explored it a little bit, but I think it didn't um, quite resonate with me. I'm a very, um, like, values, mission-driven person, uh, and I just think it didn't quite click um, mm -hmm. applying my skills in that way. I think it's super important. It's a very industry, interesting industry, but just didn't quite resonate with me. Yeah. Um, and so I was really kind of 
focused on working with small women-owned businesses and helping them with their business development plans. The pandemic really just kind of gave me this opportunity. There was a bit of a need of like, hey, I need to get out there and, and try some things. But I think all of that experience, having that experience doing some consulting on my own, um, was really what I needed to, to kind of get in the door with the my work at Medtronic. Um, so yeah, it was kind of the consulting, anthropology, um, feminist women, you know, all of that was the catalyst. And then to land in healthcare after being pre-med and like yeah. leaving that is just, again, it makes so much sense yeah. um, that that was what really resonated with me and being able to bring some of those skills and that knowledge. I worked as an EMT for some time. You so did, Ashley? In high school. <laughs> yeah. That is a huge deal. It, You know, it was really hard. <laughs> I was, everyone else, they were adults, you know, it was a volunteer okay. ambulance at the small town where I grew up. Um, and I was like 16, 17, doing all the EMT courses, like on the weekends. Wow. Um, so yeah, it was a really cool and enriching experience. Um, it feels like a very long time ago now, which I guess it kind of was, yeah. but, um, yeah, I get to kind of leverage the skills and interests that I've had in healthcare and help people. You know, I think that was a big part of what I wanted to do. So yeah, again, it's like, you kind of look back and you can see the thread through it all. Yeah. But when I was in the midst, I was kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing. Same, same. <laughs> I can't believe my parents, you know, you know, when I studied, Anthropology, women's studies. Yeah. They, they, they kind of sat back and, and let me figure that out. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I stuck with things I love because um, I get to do stuff I love. Yeah. But I think that the path to the types of jobs we have was not really paved. Mm -hmm. Maybe when you and I were going to school. Um, and it seems like there's more paths now that are paved to do the work we do. Yeah, I think so. And sometimes I'm not sure if, if it's like, cause I'm in it, you know, or I'm like, okay, now it's like when you, I don't know, like Brandeis, for example, I, I feel like I never really heard much about them or knew about them. And then as soon as I was at Brandeis, I'm like seeing it in the news, yeah. right? Like it's like that light was yeah. flipped on or something. Um, so sometimes I'm not sure if it's like, well, is it, is it my worldview, the positioning that I'm in, yeah. or is it really growing? But I think it is growing. Mm -hmm. I think you're hearing more and more and more about anthropologists in business and applied anthropological work. Even when I was in grad school, I think there was more conversation around it, but less, I think, structure or clarity around that path, right? It was like, well, you can do this, but I didn't know where to start. Absolutely. Um, and now I'm seeing more and more and, you know, there's opportunities to talk to students and network with them. And mm -hmm. um, I love that this is a path forward yeah. um, and that there's more resources around it yeah it's definitely true do you have any advice for students that are um, studying anthropology mm. and that maybe want to learn more about the type of work you and I do I mean I you know networking I <laughs> I don't like that word but I really yeah. do think connecting with like-minded people um, connecting with people who you see and you're sort of like they seem interesting and their work seems cool yeah. just send them a note you know it's it's I've connected with so many amazing people and it's interesting how they come back up in your journey um and it it's just it's never a waste of time I think to connect with another human being uh so for me I think that's a big thing but uh to what you kind of alluded to I think Trusting yourself, trusting what you enjoy, you know, leaning into those things that um, are interesting to you, that spark something in you. Uh, it doesn't always make sense, but um, I think it does in the end. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if there's any books, mm -hmm. professors, gurus, schools that you look at or think about as kind of being helpful, whether, whether it makes sense that they were or there's yeah. like some sort of bridge you had to make. I knew I was going to bring this up today yes. <laughs> and it ties actually to what I was saying, but, um, one of them is Ingrid Fatel Lee. Do you know I don't her? Know. Okay. She, um, she's a designer. I think, um, she might have she maybe used to work at IDEO, but she, uh -huh. um, she wrote a book called the aesthetics of joy. 
Um, and so I think there are nine aesthetics and she's really just dedicated much of her recent career to this idea of, you know, joy is something that can really be curated by the environment around you. And I'm actually like looking at all these plants um, and nature. That's actually one of the aesthetics. Uh, but I find that that just really resonates with me and comes up in my work. You know, we talk about delight and things like that, but um, she just joy, like joy is just the thing. And it applies to everything. I mean, you know, she has many rich examples of how do you insert joy into a healthcare experience, wow. right? Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting, cool design that's happening within clinical spaces. Um, I think particularly for children, I, and maybe you even, did you reference, I think you did a project with a... With, oh, the hopscotch. Yes, yes, yeah, like that's a perfect example, or school, you know, yeah. like just looking at the way that the world is often designed um, and like joy is kind yeah. of not a part of it. Uh, and that there's really a lot of like psychological benefits, right? Like biologically, the way that our, our minds and bodies react to things. Like one of the, one of the examples is actually like sharp corners, like this table. Yeah. Um, like your brain interprets that, like that's risky, but we, so we love things that are round and soft. So think like bubbles and confetti, also abundance, right? Like yeah. a lot of the same thing. Um, so anyway, highly recommend, um, her book, uh, the aesthetic of joy. Um, and yeah, just her work. I think it's really applicable. Uh, so she's one example great, that comes wait. to mind. Um, yeah, it's just a very like, it's, it's a very almost indulgent read. Like you kind of just, I don't even know that I've actually admittedly read the full book because yes. I'm just savoring it almost, yes. you know? Yeah. Um, but she's one that comes to mind, just somebody whose work I follow and it, it kind of is, I try to keep it top of mind of like, how do we think about joy and curating that for ourselves and yeah. in the world and in the work that we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does she have an Instagram? Like do you she follow does. some of her social media? Yeah. She has an Instagram. Um, she does webinars sometimes. Oh, she cool. does like interior, again, a lot of it is like spatial, yeah. um, which makes so much sense, but, uh, definitely an area that I am interested in. Yeah. Um, that's, I know that the intersection between research and design mm -hmm. is so close but it's so funny because I I don't consider myself a designer mm -hmm. as much as I do a researcher yeah that has a, a, I can I like good design mm -hmm. but I don't know that I can always make it what about mm -hmm. for you do you see yourself both as a researcher and a designer yeah I think probably similar to you I don't know that I would call myself a designer I think um <laughs> I do. I say I'm a researcher. We have designers on our team, right? Yeah. Like they uh, make much better PowerPoints than me, um, right? Uh, are able to just, I think that like prototyping phase, yes. right? Very much um, look to those experts. So I don't think I do. Um, and at the same time, I mean, we're constantly designing, right? Like yeah. our world, our homes, our jobs like I, I think we're making decisions that are design mm -hmm. um but yeah I think in the traditional sense I don't consider myself that yeah. not really at all no <laughs> and it's really like a but I don't want to go off and do a project by myself mm. you know and that's it's so interesting that we're in a field that is not easy to complete as a solo person yeah and that we promote this like team uh-huh and that people I we, we always talk about it at our company um the hockey puck like like mm -hmm. like follow the puck and we pass the puck yeah but like we're getting it to the finish line okay but there's a lot of puck passing yeah um, I like that yeah I like that it's a unique field that really relies so much on other talented people yes to trust each other yeah, well, I think, like, that second set of eyes, like, I, I don't even think you could do it. Your, I, like, I wouldn't want to do it myself, even mm -hmm. if I had those skills, which I don't. Because um, I just really value that feedback and bouncing of ideas. And, again, we're all coming from different perspectives. So, like, I miss a lot of stuff that yeah. you probably would see that, you know, someone else would see. Um, 
And I think it, right, we talk about human-centered design being iterative. So, like, there's always room for change and yeah. um, improvement. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, Ashley, I, about de- the word design research or the mm-hmm. term design research. Okay. I mean, we named the company Design Research yeah. Collective, and I still don't know that it's defined. So, admittedly, yeah. I Googled it this morning you because did. because I think because I had kind of a very untraditional path yeah. to write this role. Sometimes, like, people will ask me, you know, what's what's design thinking, design research? You have ethnography, you have yeah. contextual inquiry. So, this morning, I, like, woke up and was like, I'm going to be asked to define these things. So, immediately go to Google. Um, I But, no, I did... Because I was, I'm like, how do you sort of differentiate some of these things? Or are they the same? And we're just using different words. But Google said... (laughs) What did Google say? I'm so excited. Google said that design research is um, research that is really focused on the design of a product service program offering. Um, So, (laughs) makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes I think about it... I'm just thinking now out loud. Sometimes I think about it as like the design of research um, in honor of solutions rather than decisions. Mm. So building solutions rather than decisions. But um, research that is out at different parts of kind of the cycle of design. But yeah. I, I don't, and then at the beginning, and I think part of why we named it DRC was market research and design thinking coming together. Yeah. Um, so... I still don't know that there's a united moniker no, for the work that we do. I don't think so. It's starting. I think that the word human-centered design is starting to creep up. Mm-hmm. Thank you to IDEO. And, um, but it's interesting that um, I think our field is really um, new. I always mm-hmm. say to people, like, I, it's, you can't like, go to school and become a human-centered designer yet, although you might be able to now. Yeah. But about t- five, ten years ago, there, that wasn't... A path, yeah. Like yeah. you could become a lawyer or a doctor, um, but I think we're still um, juggling different monikers, mm-hmm. and there's different nomenclature in this space. Yeah, that it's going to be interesting to see ten years from now. Yeah, um, what rises to the top? Yeah, for sure. And I think even human-centered design, right, has like I that can even be differentiated, right? Like you can do. You probably can do design research that's not human centered. Yeah, I, I think that happens actually. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, right? You can design thinking is a process, but it doesn't have to be human centered. Yeah, inherently. Um, so I think like that's sort of an added layer, right? That that an important added layer. I wish it wasn't something that could be added or removed, but um, yeah. And there's so there's so much squishiness in what we do. Like there, yeah. I think that that squishiness of, of defining what we do and naming everything that we do um, makes it sometimes sometimes challenging to get other people on board. But it it's happening. Yeah. And I think the more the more momentum and the more maybe language we put around um, the phases mm-hmm. and the process, the more. Um, um, productive it can be, and the more others can can feel part of the process. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like others it can be an intimidating process because mm-hmm. it's so ill defined, mm-hmm. and it's so there's so many words floating around. Yeah. Yeah. And I I'm so curious what ten years from now is going to look like. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it continues to grow and kind of just become a part of our processing and yeah. way of thinking. Yeah. I um I think about like things like Six Sigma or mm. ag- Agile mm-hmm. sprinting things like that like they they've started to have this this process and and while I'm hopeful for that I also don't want it to get too stuck in something so mm-hmm. um so favorite part of the process so we we I think both are familiar and many of our listeners would be familiar with phases of the double diamond or human centered design. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of your phases of that work that you do? Yeah. Particularly in healthcare. I mean, I think the first, <laughs> the first one discovery, yeah. um, definitely is one of my favorite. I mean, I love that part of 
the pro and actually the planning for research. I really actually um, quite like uh, designing the research, creating the research plan. Um, I'm very much a how and a why person. I'm a little bit less of the what sometimes. Um, but yeah, just thinking through like how, who are we going to talk to? Who aren't we talking to? And what's the reason? Um, you know, what are the different ways that we can do this and, and approach this and thinking about, um, I don't want to get like too existential, but I feel like sometimes I get into like, into that where I'm like, can we do this? Like, is yeah. this okay? Yeah. I'm not sure. Like there are power dynamics at play mm -hmm. and, and how do we disrupt those and how do you do that? And, you know, a corporate environment sometimes, right? Where there's, uh, not just corporate, but business environment where mm -hmm. there's, um, boundaries and just different things, yeah. um, different things. So I think, uh, I'm very interested in that space. Uh, but I love just sitting with people and talking with them and getting to hear their experience. Mm -hmm. And then I think sharing that with others, um, you know, I just being able to really share a story that impacted me and my way of thinking with other people. Um, I think the part where I definitely look to my amazing team members is when we sort of start to right, come together and then be like, so what? Like, what yeah. do we do with this? Like, that may be the part that um, is a little more, because I'm like, who am I to say what? Yeah. <laughs> they said what? <laughs> they told us what? Yes. <laughs> um, so I think the what sometimes can be a little bit um, yeah. more challenging, but I like that planning and discovery piece, the why, the how. Yeah. What are some of the, um, if you can talk about any maybe – just t projects that you work on, whether you're talking to patients mm -hmm. or you're working with doctors or you're working with nurses, what are some of those discovery projects look yeah. like that, that you've done in your past for people that don't really know how healthcare and human yeah. design coexist? Yeah, for sure. Um, I have talked, I mean, a lot of different people, right, with different roles. Um, definitely have done patient facing projects where I'm talking to patients wow. about a particular experience, you know, whether, I mean, obviously healthcare experience or experience with a particular, um, disease state, things like that. Uh, have talked to physicians. I've observed them doing yeah. their work again. You know, we work with teams all across the company, so they have different specialties and, yeah. you know, these physicians that we speak to, um, so you get to go in office? You know, so, so I start sometimes. I started, uh, I think, in 2021, so yeah. right in the midst of the pandemic. And so still a lot of the work that I do is virtual mm -hmm. um, and that we do is virtual. And we're seeing some movement, you know, mm -hmm. getting out into the field again, which I love. I think that's one of my favorite things, especially, again, being really passionate about the healthcare space. I love being able to be, you know, at the hospital or in a clinical environment, really observing people yeah. as they work. Um, you know, yeah, registered nurses. I've talked to hospital administrators. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of different folks. We also do projects like that are kind of employee facing. So sometimes oh. it's about like our processes and, oh. you know, um, talking to employees about their experience with different things. So. Uh, again, I think that's what keeps it super interesting because it's just every single project is very different. And so it's like, okay, what is this? Like, I'm getting up to speed, you know, yeah. as much as I can. And this is new for me. Um, and yeah, it just, it, it varies on who I get to talk to, but it's a pleasure regardless. Yeah. <laughs> you get to become a spy or bird watcher to a <laughs> yes. new topic all the time. Mm -hmm. That is one of the awesome parts about our job. Yeah. Too, and probably even more so outside of in an agency like ours, we get to do some healthcare, some retail, yeah, um, some food, yeah. Um, but even within a company, a, a med device company, you're working on so many different disease states and so many different um, perspectives within that. It's yeah. such a big ecosystem. Yeah. That yeah, the fact that you talk to hospital administrators mm -hmm. one day and then patients, you know, yeah, experiencing an illness another day. Exactly. 
Yeah, and sometimes, right, there's this tension between what we hear, um, you know, when you talk about some of the challenges in the work that we do. It's like human-centered, but who's the human at the center, right? Because it's like these are complex processes and systems and experiences, and it's never just one person. There's a lot of different people involved. And so um, navigating that, right, like different needs, um, you know, I think... uh, yeah, the need of a patient versus the need of a physician and how do we negotiate those things um, is is challenging, but I think it's an interesting challenge. And again, at the end of the day, we're all humans like doing our best, I think. And, yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it's hard sometimes yeah. to, to hold those varying needs. Complexity. Yeah. And, and it's just, it feels like our world is just getting even more complex mm. in that way. Yeah. But it, but it's better than not trying. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you exactly. But I can understand this, like, um, yeah, this kind of like both and mindset yes. that we're yeah. that we're all reckoning with right now, just as a society, but in our jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Well, uh, it's the work you do sounds really amazing. I know it's always been a privilege to work in healthcare. Mm -hmm. I always feel really like privileged and just honored to get to work with healthcare, especially medical, you know, life-saving devices that, that, um, bring people health and joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to pause and see if there's any questions from others or, or thoughts. Um, Thank you, Grace. There's some knocking going on, which is kind of entertaining downstairs. I think they have an artist that, oh. that books a room, so we get to hear that. Um, so we talked about interviewing uh, and doctors. Mm. So I, I think the most kind of, and I don't want to, I don't, I, I hate to, um, I hate to say there's hierarchy, but I think the hardest one that I've done was a neurosurgeon. Mm neurosurgeons and like getting even getting a half an hour to an hour with them was nearly impossible mm-hmm. I mean um, the work they do is, is huge yeah. and then getting kind of to grow empathy and just have a have a good discussion mm-hmm. I'm curious if you have any similar experiences and then if you have any kind of point of view on when you do interview a doctor do you come with a total clean slate beginner's mm-hmm. mind or do you show up with some knowledge about their practice, about their disease state, about their devices. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it is a unique challenge. And again, it's it, depending on the specialty, right? Um, what they're doing. I think to, to your point of uh, just that experience and that time, it made me think of, I had um, a physician, I don't actually even remember the specialty, but I was doing a physician interview and you know, going through kind of the beginning parts of here's what we're going to be talking about today. Here's, you know, you can expect this conversation to take X amount of time. I think it was like a 90 minute interview. And yeah. they said, um, I don't talk to anybody for an hour and a half. <laughs> I thought, okay. And we did talk for an hour and a yes. half. I, and it wasn't like pulling, pulling teeth or anything, you know, it was truly like we were, we were conversating and I just remember feeling like, so almost like, proud that it was engaging enough and I I definitely want to like follow people's cues and we've certainly had times where I've you know there have been times I've been doing an interview with someone and their phone's ringing and they're like I have a fellow calling me like there's a patient on the table I need to go like yes doctor you go do that 100% so totally following people's lead but I think um again in terms of understanding worldview right like how somebody thinks about time or values time or prioritizes certain things um, is an important part of that. Um, I think in terms of how I show up, um, I mean, that beginner's mindset is so important. I think being like, you're the expert in your life, in your experience, 100%. And I find that, I, you know, it's helpful to be able to speak the language. Mm-hmm. Um that doesn't mean that, I, you know, you don't want to be like so far along where maybe you're not asking questions um, around something that, that they said. Uh, so I think for me, I try to find that balance where it's like I'm knowledgeable enough, like I've done enough wayfinding or discovery to kind of 
sort of get the space and I'm never going to fully get it because I'm not a doctor, right? I don't have that training. So I'm always going to be coming to it with that beginner's mindset because it's just not what I do. Um, but I think there is something to kind of being able to speak the language. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any, um, examples of that you can talk to of like one of your favorite workshops or sessions or are there types of workshops and sessions that you've done where it's been really um, really good outcomes yeah I mean I think earlier when you asked about you know what part of the process do you really like I think the, this question is making me th I, I do love the ideation process actually yeah. um, we do ideation workshops in a lot of our projects um so typically you know what that looks like is we're going out we're talking to people we're getting insights we're getting information sometimes they're giving us ideas yeah um we take all that information and and work to really understand what are the needs here um where are there opportunities uh and then we pull together these collaborative teams um people from a lot of different backgrounds you know our team, marketing, engineers, um, more than that, of course, but those are kind of the ones that are top of mind. Um, and we put together these different props of like, how, you know, here's a need that we heard about, how could we do this? Mm -hmm. And I love that process. Yeah. It's really fun. And I think part of what's really fun about it for me in particular is I don't have to do it. Yeah. Like I don't have to do the thing. So I get to like, be like, what if we did this? What if we did this? Yeah. Um, and then one of the, one of just like the tool sets, um, I don't know if that's the right word, but one of the tools that we have is analogous inspiration, right? Yeah. I love analogous inspiration. It's so fun to think about how is this being done somewhere else, like outside of med, sometimes it's in med tech, sometimes it's in technology, but sometimes it's like the lines at Disney world, right? Yes. You know, like just thinking through some of these experiences that we have and, um, ideas and how they might be applied somewhere else. Um, and now, of course, I'm looking out at the trees and I'm thinking of, um, you, you asked about things that have been inspiring to me, but uh, I've recently been learning more about biomimicry, but like how, what can nature teach us about design? Like how does nature design things and do things and how can we apply that into, again, products, experiences, right? Helping with climate change is one of them in particular. Um, but anyway, I was looking at that That's tree so out there and thinking about, um, it's an area I want to do more like reading and learning about where, um, I think you can look to nature for a lot of Absolutely. different things and inspiration. Um, so yeah, I don't know. So, I forgot the original question. But uh, no, that was <laughs> like, which, which, um, if there had been any amazing oh work. yeah so I don't have like yeah. a specific example but yeah. I just think that process yeah um is always really um just it's it's fun um and again I don't have to necessarily be the one that figures out how we might do this idea and usually it's not actually any one idea right mm -hmm. it's it's a uh, combination of a lot of different ideas and you try and then you try again and you try again and maybe you get sort of there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's that's the fun part. Um, last night I was working on a deck and I wanted to use the term, a report, mm. biophilia. Have you heard of it? It's about just the idea that nature and plants just inherently bring joy to humans. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And like just that's that, mm -hmm. kind of like just that, that biophilia. I think it's a uh, noun or I, I don't even know what, what term of speech it is but it's it's very similar to that mm -hmm. idea that we can get really inspired by nature and and, and there's a lot to learn yeah. yeah yeah thank you so much for being here and it's been such an honor to talk with you yeah, and to get to so know funny. you and your journey there's so many similarities between the two of us <laughs> I can't wait to talk I know um I really really appreciate it Grace is is telling us there's a question maybe mm -hmm. And we have a question from Amanda that says, what do you both love the most about this space, design, research, human-centered design, and what do you find most challenging about your roles? 
This has also been very fun to listen to. Oh, oh that's hi, amazing. Amanda. I think maybe that's my colleague. I, I don't oh, know. I had yeah, an idea that it was my, somebody I Oh, maybe so it's excited. your Amanda. Who knows? It's which so Amanda mysterious. It's Amanda Nagel. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's so cool. Okay. Say the question one more time, Grace. <laughs> of course. We just got excited. Yeah, we did. What do you both love the most about this space, design research, human-centered design, and what do you find the most challenging about mm. your roles? Um, I love talking to people. I feel like we're similar in that. I love human and stories. Mm -hmm. And what do I find difficult about my roles? Um, I think there's never enough time or budget mm -hmm. to do justice. Like, you know, just like this goal of, of doing it so well. Mm -hmm. And so having to sometimes um, do your best or do what we can do enough mm -hmm. to get to get to the next step. Those are probably, that's probably my answer. What about for you? Yeah, I think similarly. Yeah. I mean, I love people um, and, and their stories. And I feel very inspired and, again, like lucky um, to do what we do. Um, I, I get just any time you get to connect with someone, I think it's so special and rewarding. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, you're, you're, you're getting time with a person. And we don't, we have limited time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think... Yeah, that for me is probably what's most exciting. I think um, what's most challenging, I sort of alluded to it, but I really do think for me, I, um, just really navigating the, the how and the why of the work that we do mm -hmm. um, and wanting to be really thoughtful um, about the impact, right? You're spending time with a human, you're impacting them, right? We talk about like ripple effect. Um, but just like there's a responsibility that we have, um, an impact that we have as researchers, and um, it's not something that I take lightly. And I think I uh, am often thinking through that role and how I can do it different. You know, where the, where's their opportunity to do it differently? Um, you know, where might I be causing harm, even if it's not my intention, right? But again, it's like power dynamics are just such a reality of what we do. I think some of it probably comes um, from my anthropological background where you learn, right, like the history of anthropology and anthropologists, like there was a lot of harm um, that that happened uh, due to those those power dynamics. And so I think I'm always kind of thinking about that and investigating and looking to, um, other experts and people uh, to, to, to just learn about how I can be mindful and, and do better. Absolutely. Wow, yeah. that's a great answer. I really appreciate that. It makes me um, think in our whole conversation today, it makes me just appreciate my own job and also cannot believe how similar the two of us are. I know <laughs> we've had mutual friends be like, you have to meet. It's yes. crazy, the overlap. So I'm yeah. so glad we did and we got to spend time with whoever's listening today yeah, and so I look fun. forward to many more conversations yeah. and I can't wait to see where your career heads and um, how much joy you bring to your <laughs> healthcare uh, products and services that you're working on and helping people's lives so thank you Ashley thank you